All right. Uh, thanks for joining everybody. Thanks for inviting me to speak to you about education and public outreach for Ruben. Um, I have a couple team members joining me today and they can feel welcome to turn their video on for a couple seconds if they want. Um, I have Lauren Corleys, who's the deputy head of EPO and also the EPO scientist. And Stephanie Depe is the uh, astronomy content strategist, I think is her official title. Uh, she works on a lot of content generation and social media strategizing in particular. So they're here to support today and I wanted to make sure that they uh, are introduced to you and you're introduced to them. So thank you very much, y'all. I'll go ahead and share my screen now and also just ask Lauren in the event that I can't share my screen anymore, um, can you be my backup? <laughs> Yes, got it. Thank you. I've had a couple little internet glitches in the recent days, so hopefully it works out. Okay, um, can everyone hear me and see my screen okay? Yes. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, all right, so we are the Education and Public Outreach Group for Rubin Observatory. Um, of the observatory, there are five major subsystems right now. You've got your um, Commissioning team, the telescope and sight, camera, data management, and the EPO group is, is a, a major subsystem in itself, uh, which is really exciting. There are not many observatories who have dedicated construction funding to building the program. Uh, the one quirk of that is that we're not actually allowed to do outreach while we are in construction, um, which was a bit to get my head around when I first started <laughs> this role, um, but it, it does actually make a lot of sense right now. So all of those uh, communications that you tend to get are out of the Rubin uh, con communications group, which is a separate system from um, EPO during construction. And those are led by Ram Pal Gill, who I believe is also on the call. So, um, if I was gonna give you an overview of EPO in one slide, this is it. Uh, our mission is to provide online data-driven experiences that are accessible and approachable, adding real world context and opportunities for people to engage with Rubin Observatory and explore the universe. Our program includes a public facing website that we'll be launching once we move into operations, interactive data experiences in the browser, a sky viewer interactive app, um, classroom activities with support materials for educators, citizen science infrastructure, communications and social media strategies, and free multimedia resources. So today's presentation will be going through each of these and telling you about those. Um, you can see that it's mobile friendly there on the right. We're designing all of these things under the assumption that most people are not going to be cracking open a laptop to see, hey, what's going on with Ruben? Members of the public are going to be finding it through social media, most likely on their mobile device. So it's important that everything we create is accessible to those individuals. Uh, the other thing I'll note on this slide is that uh, we have about one more year left in our construction project. EPO plans to finish construction at the end of the next fiscal year. So at the end of September, 2022, and we will launch into operations ahead of the rest of the Rubin construction project. Um, in October, 2022. And there we go. Uh, one thing I'll note throughout this presentation is uh, I've identified in red text areas where there are opportunities for the science community to get involved. At the very end of the presentation, I'll share with you a link um, to a quick survey that I'd appreciate you sharing with your, with your co collaborators in the science collaborations, um, just to help us gain interest in the types of things that people might be interested in getting involved in. So that, that would help us sort of network and get an inventory of folks and what they're interested in. And then just another note that we're distinct from the communications uh, team right now during construction. So introductions, this is the education and public outreach team. We are fully staffed. We were able to hire our last two staff members during the pandemic. So Stephanie there on the bottom right and Eric on the bottom left. Uh, have not met anyone on the team in person yet, <laughs> but we're looking forward to uh, being able to open up that opportunity in the in the coming months. And you can see this team is quite diverse in the sense that we have astronomers, we have designers, we have developers, we have a, uh, education specialists, um, science writers. So it's a real mix of people that have come together to maximize the opportunity to use the web um, and general interactions people have on the web to produce this online program in a way that does not currently exist for um, astronomy or for ob ob other observatories. Uh, I mentioned our mission already, and I'll just point out the data-driven experiences, the accessibility, the approachability, really trying to get people to feel like, oh, 
this is for me. This isn't for some like science person. This is actually for me. That's something that we've really been striving to generate in the content that we're working on. Um, and also the engagement with people. It's not just us pushing information at them. It's really trying to engage with people and get them excited and um, interacting with us on social media and within these tools and sharing them with the people online uh, in the communities that, that, that already exist for them. How are we doing that? Well, we're building everything um, specifically for the general public. It's accessible. It's not just taking professional tools and saying, hey, public, you should know what to do with these. <laughs> Turns out the public doesn't know what kind of questions to ask. They really do need to be guided because if you just give them an open-ended problem, they haven't been trained in what questions to ask. So it has to be a mix of like entertainment, curation, making it feel like it's something that they can actually feel connected to. Um, it's interesting, we're really working on providing narratives and context for data, making it relevant for real world experiences and, mo and emotions in different cultures and things like that. Um, engaging, really encouraging folks to explore and have interactions um, and link experiences across the website, but also make it um, accessible to social media and then capable of reaching a large, large audience. One of the strategies we implemented was creating an online program as opposed to like going in person to uh, see people, which turns out to have been a good idea in hindsight now that the pandemic has <laughs> been here. Fortunately, we haven't been ready to launch our programs, um, but the way that we're thinking about it is anybody can, uh, can access it on tablets or phones, um, but also you know we've got a cloud-based data center that's going to power it so that teachers can uh, use this in their classroom without needing to download anything, without needing to worry about firewalls, without needing to have a professional astronomer in the room to feel confident to present this to their students. So we're really thinking about that back-end stability for, you know, a hundred, a thousand teachers to be able to use this across the country, across the world at the same time. These are the major audiences for EPO. We are very much focusing on the, the general public, non-specialists. So formal educators, who are the ones who will be bringing these activities into their classroom at the level of middle school, high school, and college introductory level. So that's sort of um, uh, teenagers <laughs> and um, non-astronomy majors in college. The science interested general public, citizen science, specifically principal investigators as an audience for construction. And, and we'll talk about that more, but then in operations, we'll move to all the actual citizen scientists who, uh, who participate in those programs and then informal science centers. So throughout this talk, um, I'm gonna go through each of these. Each of these audiences have specific things that we're developing for those audiences, but you can see by the little colored dots underneath that any one, um, deliverable from our program also reaches multiple audiences. So it's rare that we're building something one off for one particular group. We're really trying to maximize the accessibility of all the things that we're building um, for all of these audiences that we've identified. So I'll go through each one of these in turn throughout the, um, throughout the talk. And we'll start here with the science interested general public. We are building a dedicated website for the public that will be available in Spanish and English. Um, our communications plan around traditional and social media, and then also interactive visualization tools. So the public facing website here, you can see a couple screenshots of our prototype, still using the old temporary logo. So I should probably update those at this point. <laughs> um, it'll be uh, accessible in regular format and then also on um, mobile device. It hosts all the content that's relevant for the general public. Um, it's designed to be inclusive for all users. We'll be doing um, a accessibility audit. So meeting the national standards of WCAG for uh, if anybody's familiar with those. Um, the website features are interactive, they're engaging, they're embeddable and um, shareable with other social media. Um, and then as a note, we are focusing on the general public as our audience. Scientists, you all in your community will be um, receiving communications from Fed, but also from the Rubin Operations Community Engagement Team. So CET has been formed specifically with the science community in mind, and we're working closely with them, but they're focused on the content that you all need to know to do your science. We're focused on what we need to get out to the general public to make them feel like this is a valuable use of taxpayer dollars and that they're engaged and feeling like this is for them as well. The Sky Viewer is an interactive tool 
uh, that is intended to provide a fun, intuitive way for the public to explore Rubin discoveries. We're not just presenting, for instance, the portal aspect of the science platform. Um, this is going to be an all sky viewer that's powered by the co added color images um, of the Rubin data releases and We offer um, information or we offer open exploration when people can zoom, pan, um, kind of go anywhere in the universe that they want. Uh, users can, can use filters and we'll be providing little tours like the 10 most distant galaxies in the universe or the you know, 10 most exciting supernova, all this sort of buds feed <laughs> type listicles are the things that really capture uh, the imagination and the feeling from the audience that this is a tool for them. And then as they start to explore and we see what they're uh, looking at, we can offer opportunities for them to go someplace else. Hey, we've noticed that you're interested in supernova. Would you like to see a profile of a uh, a scientist who works on supernova, or here's a citizen science project that features supernova. So uh, like you want to hunt for your own supernova, let's go over to citizen science. So all of these things are sort of linked together and feed each other based on what uh, the user is doing. The current status of the sky viewer, uh, we're in the process of developing, um, well, we've developed the prototype, we've been using Aladdin as the, the um, back end for it. Um, this maximizes our ability to work with other surveys as well. Um, it's open source, so that's good. We're in contact with the Aladdin team. Um, it allows us to use all sky images that exist during construction <laughs> before we have uh, the Rubin imaging, which feels ages away when we're starting to build the tools. Um, and now we're working with the Rubin data management team just to ensure that the all sky color image generation meets the EPO needs um, as opposed to just sort of the scientific needs. And so we're exploring methods right now for making color images, making them look good using the broadband and so many filters. There's not too many um, observations that are available with just the, the broadband filter range that Ruben has. So we would love uh, some interactions with science community for people who like making color images, who wanna help us with this, help us satisfy um, the almost algorithmic way to make images that look good to the public. So that's something we'd love to have some help with. Uh, moving on to the next one, the goals and communications um, strategy. So our primary communications goals are really to promote awareness of Rubin Observatory, the people involved, the science, and the EPO program activities that are available for free to everyone. Um, our strategy centers around reaching and engaging with the broad and diverse audience. Um, and our social media strategy for operations is currently in development, although Stephanie has started to spend a little bit of her time um, or participating and engaging with social media now so that we can sort of get familiar with how what's working, what's not working, what are our, our audiences that we're reaching. So we're, we're starting a slow transition into launching into these goals and strategies. The presentation slides link you to a document that describes the strategy if you're curious about what it looks like. And then next year, we'll start to build the implementation plan of how we actually implement the strategy that we're developing now. So really, we want to make our content relatable and enjoyable to the general public. We want to meet audiences where they already are online through social media. And we want to make content shareable and accessible on social media. So we're starting to ramp this up, as I mentioned. Um, we would love to have an inventory of Ruben scientists who are on social media, who are active, who we can you know, link to, we can engage with online, we can seek information from. Uh, one of our next campaigns is the week of July 19th, which is the uh, week of Vera Rubin's birthday. And so we're really trying to collect your personal stories of, of how you know or how you've interacted with or how you've um, experienced you know, Vera Rubin's influence in astronomy. So if you're interested, reach out to us. Again, I'll give you a list at the end of the presentation. Uh, we are doing an initiative on staff profiles. So a goal of, of what we wanna do is to highlight people who build the observatory and who are making the scientific discoveries. We really want these profiles to feature staff and scientists who contribute in any area. We wanna make them interesting. We wanna show a diverse range of people. We wanna show the diverse range of work that goes into um, making this whole science endeavor possible. Um, and we're particularly interested in featuring people whose voices typically aren't heard. Um, so in the next year, we'll be reaching out, we'll be asking for volunteers to be featured. You see Fed has already uh, worked with Kristen on one version of this in construction. Um, and we'll also be asking for nominations of other science collaboration members to be featured. And we'll be working directly with people to help uh, make this happen. 
Um, so back to interactive tools for a minute, I want to highlight an other set of interactive tools beyond Sky Viewer. Sky Viewer is sort of a self um, encompassing web application. And we're also creating things that we're kind of calling widgets that are ways to interact directly with data. Um, and they serve the purpose of both delivering our education interactions and also they will eventually be more generalizable so that you can just embed them in websites or social media or wherever uh, you want. So these are browser based tools for directly interacting with real astronomical data um, designed around actions familiar to a typical user. So what you can see is a screen capture of one of the pages in one of our educational activities where the students are asked to um, identify supernova and a galaxy and then they're able to plot points right here, which is critical um, need for their level of education. And then once they do that, they then go and plot the Hubble diagram and start to understand how we can determine that the universe is expanding. So here's a couple other uh, screen captures of some other examples of the types of widgets we're, we're developing. Um, as I said, these are used inside classroom activities and throughout the website. Um, you can imagine once we have press releases for science, we can try to embed some of these examples that people can interact with instead of just looking at a pretty picture, they can actually interact with the types of data that were used for the types of science conclusion that the press releases is highlighting. So we turn a passive experience like reading an article into an interactive experience where people are participating in, in the idea of how we went from an image to some scientific conclusion. And then they can share that with folks. And then they are uh, engaged to participate in some other aspects of things that like citizen science projects or a sky viewer tour that are around that type of topic. Here you can see how we've integrated a light curve into this and also um, a solar system model to identify some of the, the newer types of objects that Ruben will be identifying inside of the solar system. So to expand a little bit on the formal education program uh, that we're developing, the goal is to have a data-driven program that's intuitive. It brings real data into a classroom. We focused on middle school, high school, and intro college. Um, these activities, we're calling them investigations. We're designing about eight investigations that cover a range of topics. Um, each individual investigation has a progression of concepts and tasks that are necessary for the students to get to the big ideas of the investigation. They typically last about one to two hours to go through, depending on what the topic is. They're usable by anyone. You just go to a URL and you can use them. Um, astronomer is not required. You don't have to download anything. So they're teacher friendly. They're also tied to the next generation science standards in the US, which is pre-college um, and the curriculum national in Chile. They'll be available in English and Spanish. Um, and we are during construction, user testing all the materials, all the support materials, uh, the professional development activities with teachers, with students, just to make sure that they are hitting the mark for what teachers need in their classroom and that students are able to understand and achieve the learning outcomes that we've defined for them. So hopefully through this iterative process of user testing, by the time we're ready to roll out our programs, we've already convinced ourselves that these are useful, these are the right level, these are the right technology, there's no major glitches <laughs> in um, the interactive parts of the program. Here's a couple um, other screenshots of different activities that we have. You can see the, the website on the right. So the formal education program is a set of investigations on different topics. Each of those eight investigations have a teacher guide, assessment materials to help assess if the students are achieving the learning outcome, um, standards for whatever NGSS or things you need. There's a hook and phenomenon, which is tied to that NGSS. There's a single website for everyone to access everything. And there's also professional development for educators to gain confidence, not only in using the tool will be new to them, but also in the, the astronomical concept that they'll be teaching in their classrooms. Here's a list of those eight investigations, the different topics. Um, I highlighted coloring the universe and sol surveying the solar system because it's looking like those are probably the first two that we will be uh, rolling out once we move into operations. The rest of them, you know, some of them, well, all of them at the moment are using precursor data from other observatories, other facilities, um, or simulations. 
and they are functional and we can do all the learning outcomes. Um, ultimately, we will be incorporating Rubin data to these. They're designed to take Rubin data, um, but some of them are gonna function better or worse with uh, precursor data. So these two seem to be the most um, likely for early rollout right when we get to October, 2022. Uh, there's a link here that I'll share with you in my conclusion side, but this is a, a demo of some of those interactives that I shared um, screen captures with. You can go and play around with that. They're um, like individual pages out of an educational investigation. So you certainly don't have the framing of how we get a student to be able to do that particular ask on that page, but at least you can experience the, the interactions yourself. They're pretty fun. Let us know what you think. Um, and so all of these activities I've mentioned so far, the website, um, these interactive tools, the education program, uh, we will go through an astronomy review of these. I mean, the EPO team has worked really diligently to make sure we produce content that is accurate of Rubin Observatory and its science. But we also recognize we're not content experts in every aspect of science that the observatory will be conducting. So what we'll be doing is inviting scientists to help review the content related to their field of study to ensure that there's accuracy, um, across our website. We'll provide a charge um, and some guidelines for the review and a format for providing feedback. It shouldn't be a, a hugely time intensive activity, um, but we'll work with individuals to assign content that matches the level of effort that they're interested. If they wanna review the whole website, cool. <laughs> if you are only interested in solar system things, we will uh, give you solar system stuff. So we'll be uh, looking for volunteers Sometime in the near future, we're still working on getting the charge together. I'd hope to get it before the end of this summer, but it, events have overtaken us. So keep a lookout on that. Definitely during the next year, we'll be in initiating that process. Okay, um, moving on to citizen science. I wanna make sure I leave enough question time at the end because I see y'all are having lots of chats. Uh, so the citizen science program, what we have decided to do uh, at a strategic level through EPO is set up infrastructure so any researcher can easily create any number of citizen science projects using LSST data starting with the tools that exist in the science platform. The other option was that maybe we created and led a couple citizen science projects, but we felt like how do we know what's the best science question to ask? <laughs> Why don't we open up the opportunity for you know a thousand different citizen science projects using LSST data that actually help you do your science uh, to get created as easily as possible. So what you would do is you go into the science platform, there's gonna be all kinds of material to help um, you understand how you uh, create a science, a citizen science project. You can use the tools inside of the science platform and then you send your data directly to the Zooniverse project builder tool. We're partnering, partnering with Zooniverse out of the UK to make this happen. Um, they are one of the most internationally successful uh, citizen science infrastructures that exist. So it was a natural fit for us to work with them and the infrastructure they've already got built. Um, we'll be working closely with the CET team in operations that I mentioned before. Uh, they actually have a dedicated community scientist for citizen science who will be scientist facing um, to help incorporate any kind of machine learning to help identify best practices for how you can set up a project and engage with your audience and maximally uh, impact a diverse number of citizen scientists who are actually participating in your project. So we wanna help maximize the types of results you're getting by offering support for best practices in citizen science. Um, we'll do a lot of marketing for you. We will uh, just help on um, the advertising and the design side of things. So the status of that right now is we're still in construction. We're building the infrastructure. We're working with data management and Zooniverse. Um, we're planning on commissioning two projects in fiscal year 22. And so by the time um, we actually get data, uh, you should have access to the infrastructure and all the training materials in order to start a project. And finally, informal science centers. What we are producing is a set of free multimedia. So as part of the construction project, we've um, created about 20 short planetarium format, so full dome video clips that feature a range of astrophysical concepts that Rubin um, Science will offer. We have, you see, we've um, derived a nice full dome version of the, the Rubin Observatory facility. Um, we'll also provide a set of, you know, six-ish by the time we get to operations uh, videos that are all short clips that talk about Rubin itself, its um, technology, its science, um, and some of the people. 
And we're also finishing a workflow so that we start to be able to create new videos as we move into operations. So looking towards the future, um, we will be finishing our construction project at the end of uh, uh, September, 2022. Here's a little graph of what the Rubin operations team looks like. If you haven't seen this before, you can see there's four departments identified here, observatory operations, which operate the facilities, data production, system performance, and education and public outreach. So we will continue to work very closely with data production to bring um, data products over into the EPO data center. We'll be working with system performance as well as we you know, curate science stories and do the citizen science program. Uh, but this is a bit of a new, a new twist on the story. Um, the Rubin Education and Public Outreach team will not be uh, a part of Rubin Operations. We will actually shift our team to Noir Lab and we will operate within their communications, education and engagement group. So that team, when Noir Lab was formed about two years ago, took on all of the former NOAO, Gemini, CTIO, Kit Peak education and public outreach group. And so now they're, they're a pretty large group. And so Ruben will be moving into that group and operating out of that group starting from October, 2022. So here's a rough timeline. Uh, we're about ready to start our last year of construction. We're doing ongoing user testing um, and auditing of our entire site. We'll be doing uh, an astronomy review, as I mentioned. Uh, next year at the PCW, I can imagine some very large celebrations of us being able to cross the finish line of construction first um, and really having a full uh, suite of activities for everybody to go play with and demo. Um, we'll be launching our public facing website at, you know, sometime in October 2022. So part of the end of our construction project after we go through the National Science Foundation official acceptance review, we intend to launch our public site this will retire lsst.org. We're transferring all the relevant information over to our site. Um, and then that will be live from October 2022. So everything will be accessible then. Um, and information for scientists will continue to come out. Project.lsst.org will exist. Uh, Rand Powell's communication team out of the director's office will continue to exist. And the community engagement team will be continuing to focus on scientists and where you all can get your information and have everything that you need. What we're doing is really focusing on the public audience. So to summarize all that red text that you've been seeing throughout the presentation, how can the scientific community get involved at this point and moving forward? So right now we have um, a liaison to each science collaboration who are our first points of contact when we have uh, questions. To be honest, we haven't really interacted with too many people. We haven't had too many asks of people because we've been so focused on sort of the design and initial development. Um, and Lauren's been doing a heroic effort to try to capture different types of data across every field of astronomy, which y'all do things much differently. You don't have the same conventions. <laughs> and it's really hard for a single person to try to make sense of it. Oh my goodness. Uh, so in the near future, um, Joining in conversation on social media, responding, interacting with the Ruben accounts, um, letting us know if you've got an idea or highlighting something that you see. We're paying attention to when people mention us, but we're really trying to ramp up our engagement aspect right now. Um, participating in the EPO session, we'll have one at the PCW that goes into some of these things I've presented today a little bit more in depth. We're probably going to be sending out a survey before the PCW just to get gauge the interest of what people um, want to know. And so we can uh, do our session based on that feedback that we get. It'll be a pretty quick, like no more than five minute kind of survey. Um, if you can offer expertise in color image creation, that would be a big help. Um, helping review the scientific content of the educational investigations and the website at large. Uh, and then some of the precursor data, you know, as I said, Lauren's done a heroic effort in finding some of these things, but we could still use a little bit of help in certain areas to explore some subtle concepts that we just haven't really been successful in finding data for. Um, and then if you could share this survey that I mentioned here, ls.st slash epo survey uh, with your collaboration so that we can start to gain interest. Um, we can build a network, we can understand what people might be interested in, in uh, participating in, and we can reach out to them. So uh, that'll be happening in the next year. And then um, as we move into operations, 
y'all are going to be the inspiration for a lot of the new content that we, we produce. I mean, we're really trying to highlight the data and the science in ways that it has not been highlighted by other groups before. So having you kind of, you know, share with us when you have a paper coming out, what your science is, if you have ideas for visualizations or graphics or things that enhance your particular project or your field, we would love to work with you to bring in some of our graphic design and science communication expertise to maximize the impact of these ideas that you have. Um, coming to us with new results to feature in our activities, oh, sorry, um, or you know, potentially to turn into a press release. I know when I was uh, really doing a lot of my research, I always felt it's too complicated. There's no way this could ever be translated into a press release. But working with press officers at my institutions and reaching out to some science communication professionals who are eager to try to help you know, find the right analogies and the right way to tell your story to a public audience. That's what we want to do. So, you know, reaching out to us with those ideas um, really will, will be a great benefit to all of us, I think, and Rubin Science. Um, providing data sets for uh, features in our web tools. Uh, we can give you all the asks. We have very specific asks right now and we're open for ideas. Um, creating citizen science projects when we have that infrastructure ready to go. Um, receiving science communication training if you're interested how to make the biggest impact how to create better slides how to find a narrative in your complicated science story um, improves not only your science communication to the public but also funding agencies and also the science community i think people tend to overcomplicate things um, finding templates and support materials for your presentations will be helping um, develop those sorts of things for you. And then also using these educational investigations in your classrooms, you're more than welcome to do that. And we'd also love to try to um, continue to increase the diversity of students that we're able to test with while we're in construction. So we welcome recommendations for how we can best facilitate these, um, these relationships. Here's another summary of what the EPO program is. And I'll leave you with this slide, which has uh, the link to the survey at the top and the demo that you can go play with as you wish. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. That was great. So much content. Um, <laughs> yes. And thank you, everybody at the, from, from the EPO team, both like the team as a whole and Stephanie Lur in particular for being here today. Um, there's a lot of questions in the chat. I propose that I read through them a number of them are from me, so that will be easy. Uh, I propose that I read through them in the interest of time and then more question open floor and discussion, okay? So the first question is from me. Uh, so you mentioned that the website will be available in English and in Spanish. Any, um, any plans on expanding that, especially considering that the alerts are word public, so there will be worldwide engagement with Rubin, right. presumably. For our construction project, um, the requirement we are given by the agencies and set for ourselves is that everything is fully available in Spanish and English. And not just like Google translated into Spanish, but fully like <laughs> written for a Spanish speaking audience. Um, there is the capability for it to be translated into any language, but that's gonna be something after we launch that we move into actually making that accessible. Okay. And it would be interesting at that point to like think how to prioritize languages because there's a lot of languages that are popular, but yeah, I mean, the easiest route would be the people who have offered to do the translation <laughs> work for us, but fair enough. <laughs> fair see enough. What out when we actually do our detailed uh, schedule planning for, for those years. Super. So Peregrine asked if um, the website will be fully Section 508 compliant. Well, what I can tell you is it's WCAG level double A, um, and I'd have to re refer to my uh, web developer as to whether or not that includes section 508. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is be well beyond my expertise on the topic. Peregrine, are you satisfied with this answer? No, I don't see Peregrine on anymore. Okay, well, we're going to assume that he was satisfied. Um, and if not, that he will reach out. Um, so you mentioned that you focus on general public, right? But then you also mentioned classroom, and that includes presumably higher education environments. And so what are the boundaries of the CET engagement and the EPO engagement when you're talking about 
um, classroom material in college, maybe even grad school. Yep. So uh, we put very clear um, sort of intentional boundaries around what we were building. You can make a choice to either do everything for everyone and not really do any of it well, or really focus on a particular audience and do that well. And where we found a dearth of opportunity, well, a dearth of, of resources and the um, highest opportunity was in that sort of teenager, like science intro college level. There's not really many resources that, that allow you to interact with data in that frame. So that's really where we focused on. Um, I think, you know, when you all look through these investigations, if you feel like it's appropriate, I mean, we're not offering a whole curriculum on any topic. We're offering maybe a one to two hour activity. And if it- But sorry, just to clarify, just, to, just to make sure I understand your answer, that means high school? Yeah, in high school, grade? middle school. So sort of sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth through 12th for the US. Got it. Um, and then, you know, uh, a non-astronomy major, if you have to take like one science course and you take like astronomy 101 or something, this would be really great for that level. Um, mm -hmm. It's not focused on people who like, I, I guess my assumption is if, if you want to send your grad students to do research or you, even your undergrads, send them to the science platform. That's where you're going to find the tools to actually do the research. What we're trying to do is make people who are not specialists feel like they can actually do something with the data. Oh yeah, let me let me clarify what I meant, even though don't take it as like me insisting that you expand beyond your boundaries, which seem fine by me. But like what I meant was more like, you know, for example, students not of astronomy, but of other physics disciplines or even of data science, because this is such a great playground for data science, right? That would not be able to, I mean, it would be very hard to send into the science platform. It would probably not be worth it, but it would be great if they could engage with this data without any domain expertise really. Yep, so that part of our intention is to have an API so that anybody can pull the data from what we have available in the public database, mm -hmm. um, but we're not teaching data science. Got it. Uh, so, right. Um, have you included, so this is Catherine's question, have you included in your strategy that technology will probably change a lot over the next 10 years? Resources uh, you haven't developed just tools that are building now. Yeah, absolutely. This has definitely been on the forefront of our minds and it was a risk in starting five years ahead of, of launch to build a website and build all these tools. So what we've done to try to mitigate that risk is build on modern tools that are updated by groups, not by ourselves. We are like we're building with JavaScript, we're building with Craft, which is a, a common um, content management system that is regularly updated by the community that's not us. And so these things are responsive to what's happening with technologies and are able to plug into um, you know, social media systems and, and track with that modern framework. I also have incorporated into my budget for operations about every three years, a technology refresh um, with whatever that means at that time. So we're definitely trying to mitigate that risk of like launching and immediately looking like we're old <laughs> um, as best as we can. And um, on that, I think on that note, although I'm not sure, um, there is a comment about the interactivity mode that will be particularly helpful in lecture classes that was left by Peregrine. So I think that relates to like yeah. technology updates. I can offer that um, some of the feedback we're, we've been getting from the classroom teachers, they're mostly angry that they can't use it immediately. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. So we're really excited to get this out there. Um, will you be able to monitor which approaches get the most attention? Are you going to do continuing user service or things like that? Yeah, absolutely. So we've got um, integrated analytics across our web platform. We're also monitoring social media pretty in-depthly um, with the idea that we're identifying certain key performance metrics uh, that we're collecting over time. And then we're using those to evaluate what's working well. Let's do more of that. What's not working well? Can we improve it or should we you know, get rid of that and not spend effort on it anymore? So that is a, a fully intentional part of our, of our strategy moving forward. Will you share that with other people as well? I mean, like it, it will be very interesting for others to know this, right? Like because one is always thinking, what can we do? Yeah, so our intention um, by the end of construction is to, to publish a paper that talks about our design, the system as built, and also give some insight as to why we made some of the decisions we did. We were able to go out and talk to a, a set of um, 
diverse representations of our user groups and ask them, like, if you had access to all this astronomy data, what would you want to do? And like, we got really interesting feedback from that exercise. And that's what informed the strategy that we went with, like, for instance, choosing middle school, high school and college 101. And so part of this publication will have an appendix that really goes into the details of what informed our strategy, where are we right now, and then hopefully every um, so specifically every three years, we have it in our budget during operations to hire an external consulting group to help do that evaluation. We'll be going about it, you know, we'll be monitoring things live because I want to see how people are using it. Um, but we'll offer all of those KPIs to this external group to get some kind of unbiased um, assessment of whether or not our activities are achieving the intended outcomes that we have for those audiences. And so we'll be making all of that fully publicly available. I imagine we'll, we'll write up the equivalent of a tech note um, and get it out there at least once every three years, but hopefully more often than that as we have time. Yeah, that's awesome. I imagine that some groups like the science collaboration may engage in their own, you know, smaller, much smaller scale, but their own EPO activities for their communities and having that information from the from the EPO team will be really useful. And I've done a lot of um, communication with existing groups like DES and ZTF and some of those just to mm -hmm. hear, I mean, most of those are powered by scientists volunteer time. It's very rare that someone has a dedicated amount of time paid to be able to lead those programs. And so they've had a lot of lessons learned over the course of that. And so we've also tried to incorporate that. And so since we have this funding, I think it's absolutely a thing that we should be doing for the community to offer our successes and areas for improvement. Awesome. Um, I, I've talked to you about this before, but it, how's, how have you diversified your alpha and beta testing pool? Are you, have you included um, community, diverse communities so that you make sure that you actually have can reach all those communities in productions? And maybe can yeah. we help you if you have, like, can we provide you connection to, through the science collaborations to, um, I don't know, to colleges or, or places that, that you haven't been able to reach? Yes, absolutely. Um, so we are doing our best, different things that we had planned to do. I, I think you were actually in communication with artists, Fed, and, and she had planned to come up and visit your institution right when the, uh, the pandemic hit. And so we had planned to go to a few different geographical areas so that we could meet with, you know, kind of targeted audiences. Um, unfortunately, the pandemic hit. And so we were immediately required to pivot our entire user testing strategy to online because we couldn't get that in person. Like we couldn't build um, relationships with indigenous cultures. Like we would have been able to take technology with us to go work with those groups, but that needing to be online and be connected really um, prevented some of our aspirations. And so we've done the best that we could in that. We've really been reaching out, artists has done a heroic effort, particularly for the education program, um, to work with different types of school groups around. So, you know, urban and rural, um, different makeups, different geographical uh, populations. We really want to understand, you know, if, if a school only has a computer lab as opposed to tablets for every individual student, like how does that affect their ability to use this investigation? What is their broadband connection? Does that help? Do students, are they able to complete this in time? Things like that. Um, so we've done a pretty good job. Uh, part of the challenge is when, um, especially with middle school and high school audiences, we've tried to set up some Zoom sessions with them. And, and frankly, teachers have been really excited to uh, have a, an online activity that they can use with their classrooms. But each school district has a different um, regulation as to whether or not we can even be present on a Zoom call with them. So <laughs> the challenge of trying to coordinate and achieve the goals that we've had with our user testing is uh, we have done our best. Uh, I think we actually have a, a report on the makeup of the, the user testing that we've done. And it, there are um, some population of people among all the populations that we were hoping to test with, although the ratio of the numbers is a little bit lower than we were hoping to achieve in the end. Well, I think this would be, if you need support in this, um, I think I would very strongly advocate for the science collaboration doing everything that they can to help you on this aspect. So um, do holler if you want that. Um, well, we, should you have mean, that we should add that to our survey for the scientists. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, no, that's actually a fair, um, a fair question. Like, do you have reach within communities um, and connections within communities? I think we may find a lot of like 
back doors to enter these these classrooms. Um, I made a comment, which was that you said you want to encourage um, the main experts as the scientists to help you with the accuracy. And I just want to warn you, I'm, I'm sure you're thinking about it, but I just want to warn you that this has to be phrased correctly. Otherwise, we're going to open a lot of cans that you don't want to open and we end up demanding unachievable accuracy on things just because it's kind of percent agree with that, which is why it's actually taken us so long to generate the charge. Because in addition yeah. to that, we also want to sit down and think through, you know, what's our decision making process after the review? What sort of things are we going to choose to take on board and what things are we not? Because we are the experts for the public audiences. And so, you know, if we get into the weeds of some little astronomical detail, that doesn't necessarily improve our audience's ability to achieve the outcomes that we intend for them. And so, yeah, we're, we're trying to really deeply think through how to make this beneficial <laughs> and not a time sink. <laughs> Um, let me ask one last question and then I'll, my, Meg has a question. Are you going to continue to be our point of contact for press releases during operations or is the Noir Lab PR um, going to take over? Yeah, good question. So right now, RANPAL is your connection for press That's releases. right. So RANPAL will continue to be that connection for Rubin press releases through the end of construction, which will last probably till at least October 2023, um, maybe longer than that. So for the time being, Rampal is your established connection and continue to that. And she will then um, also work with Noir Lab as we move into operations to, to tap into that. So we'll, we'll kind of migrate and evolve, but Rampal will be your main point of contact for now. Got it. Meg, do you wanna ask the question that you put in the chat? Sure. So I, I guess I'm asking in terms of the future Right. So say you find some weird solar system object. Obviously, for outreach, you want to have your video ready to go. Right. You want your all your tools. But I also have like my institution's press officer who wrote a really bad press release that I'm trying to correct. Right. Or whatever. Right. How do we I guess what's the formula of how you're going to work with these different teams so that I don't have to contact you to be like, hey, this is really an exciting thing that you might want to make a video for or an, 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 something like, you know, a tour for in your sky viewer while I'm also trying to get Noir, like Noir Lab, you know, Ruben on the press release. So I guess is, do you have a vision of how that all works? And as someone who's got something in say early science, when we've got the commissioning data release, how does that work? Like, am I sending multiple emails or do, or like trying to raise this with the community engagement team to go, no, really, this is interesting. All right. Um, so thanks for that have question. you thought about that? I can, um, I can offer my uh, take on that and then I'll open it for Rampal to see if she has another comment. Um, so the way that I've done this in the past is um, expected someone to reach out to their press officer at their institution. Like you should definitely be communicating with your institution's press officer and then as far as like the Ruben Noir lab side goes, I think you should be able to reach Rand Powell and just say, hey, this is coming up, put her in contact with your institutions, press officer, and then Rand Powell would build that, has that network, that community within Noir lab to then collaboratively work with all those groups to pr produce the press release. So you, I would imagine, you know, initially you reach out to one press person with us, one press person with your um, institution, and then the institution and, and Rand Powell can, can work to develop it all. I mean, I'm never gonna know that you're doing something unless you tell me that you're doing something. So there's always gonna have to be that step where you let me know, or you let Rand Powell, you let us know somehow, but I'm hoping that there's an efficiency within the Ruben Noir Lab <laughs> frame that you only have one point of contact and then we make it happen. So I'll let Rand Powell comment on that. Yeah, I think you summed it up pretty well. That's pretty much what we think is the route we want to take that I would be that conduit. I have the links into the Noir Lab area and uh, I meet with them regularly already actually. Um, that will continue into the future and we we'll keep them abreast of these things. And I think communication is going to be really important to know what's coming up because what we don't want to do is see it in the press and then, hey, you know, oh, we could have done a bigger splash or, you know, we could have also been added to this, whatever. So, yeah, I think keeping close communication uh, ear to the ground is going to be essential. So perhaps... Oh, go ahead, Ben. Perhaps the science collaborations have to do some thinking about internally, what do they do? How do they facilitate this process? How do we make sure that they, their members know 
what the right procedure is and who to contact. Yeah, I think also just that it, it sounds like, again, because there's all these other tools that you'd want to have a tour in your sky viewer, that takes time, but that's not just it. Where a lot of press releases are that last minute running around, right? Of like, <laughs> you can you can core to get a press release out faster, right? If you can push on that, this sounds like this might need a little bit more headway. And that might be something to start telling the community about that if you really want to make it that really seamless engagement that, you know, the app, the, the apps show the same cool things or have something for that video, right, to, to really engage, you can't have a week's notice to, to do that. And yeah. that might That's be something to think about of how to get us to be better. It's a really good point, Meg, and I take that on board. And so, you know, we still have a year left of our construction. I'm not ready for all your exciting science news yet. <laughs> um, and so one thing that we can work on generating is sort of a document and a, and a messaging starting with today's presentation and survey that we send out with, through all of you all and building that network so that we can have maybe a, if you think you might be interested in somehow advertising some science, here's the steps to follow and here's the timeline. And then we can try to keep that document updated and advertise it on community and all that kind of stuff. Yeah.